when we were worshiping, um, I kept hearing the word change. Change. And I kept thinking, yes, because we've got a lot of changes going on. And I, you know, just kind of like, eh, it's just, it's just me. It's just my, my, uh, my thoughts change. And, but the Lord keeps pressing that into me because, you know, yeah, we have change. We have, um, we had to change from being in there in the, the back part to being in here because there's no lights out there. Electricity, the electrician is supposed to come tomorrow and there's some breaker up in the ceiling. And so, so we had to be flexible and change. And I thank God for Stephen and Jonathan who rearranged everything. <laughs> but so we had to be changed. But even while we were sitting there, my mom texted me and there's two members of my family that's having major life changing events today. I'm thinking, you know, we, a lot of times we think about change and, and, and the Lord's like, you know, you've been saying you want change a lot for the last five years. We're ready for change. We're ready for change. But the Lord's saying, I'm giving you grace. and I'm being gracious unto you. And I'm giving you fair warning. There's going to be change. So be prepared. Some change is good. Some change is easy. Some change is not so easy. But the Lord is giving us special grace right now. And, and giving us fair warning. We're in change. And so we can say, thank you, Lord. We can say, oh me, oh my. But be prepared. So, anyway, that's not the message, but I can't get it out of my head or out of my heart. So, there you go. Okay. Change. Thank you, Lord. Okay. Well, some things we know never change. <laughs> and that's, God created us. God created man to have fellowship with him, right? And in Genesis 3, it says the Lord was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. God created us in part for fellowship, but he was also created to rule the world, to rule the earth. In Genesis 1, of course, we all know it. In 26, he said, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creepy thing that creeps on the earth. So we're, we're to have dominion. God, that's the thing that God created us for. And part of that ruling would have been to give reports to the Lord, to bring, to, to give him account. In Job 1, we see where in verse 6 it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And right there, Adam would have come and gave his report to the Lord. But because Adam had given his authority over to Satan, the rest of that says, now there was a day where the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. So Satan was there in the heavens because Adam had forget, forgotten and, and gave him our, our authority. But we were actually created to go into the heavenlies. We were created to be there. We're still created to be there. That's part of our makeup. That's part of our DNA. So tonight we're going to discuss visitations to heaven, their precedence and their purpose. Okay. Now I'm trying, I'm, I'm going to go a little bit fast because we've got a lot to cover, but if I go too fast, tell me to slow down. <laughs> okay. So, cause I, I do want to, we're, we're going to read a lot of scripture because I want this all to, for you to see this in the scriptures that going to heaven is not just a new Testament thing. It's not even covenant access. Okay. This happened before covenant. This happened. Um, going to heaven happened. Adam went to heaven, but besides Adam walking with the, with God in the, in the garden, the first person that we have account of going to heaven is was Enoch. This was before the covenant with Moses. So pre-covenant, Enoch walked with God. And we know in Genesis 5, verse 24, it says, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Okay? And then it gives us the account in Hebrews 11, in the, in the faith chapter, that Enoch was taken away, so he did not see death. So we know that. We understand that. But we want to know 
what else really happened to Enoch? Now, the book of Enoch, I understand, is not in the Bible. Okay, but it's referred to a lot. It's quoted a lot, even by Jesus, it was quoted. And so we're going to look at a few excerpts in the book of Enoch. Again, we're not taking this at, to the same level as we would take the 66 books of the Bible. But it gives us some information. Okay, so Enoch 1, chapter 1, verse 3, says, Enoch, a righteous man, whose eyes were opened by God, saw the vision of the Holy One in the heavens, which the angel showed me, and from them I heard everything, and from them I understood as I saw, but not for this generation, but for a remote one, which is for to come. Right there, the book of Enoch is given. The purpose of the book of Enoch was, it was not for his generation. It was for a gener generation, remote one. It was for our generation. Because the book of, in the book of Enoch, there's instructions that we need as we're walking into the kingdom era. And so the book of Enoch was not, it was said, is for a remote one. It was for our generation. So a lot of times when people are, the visitations for people are for, especially just this, this generation, going into the end of times, going into the kingdom. Um, Daniel was also given things for this generation. Okay, but the book of Enoch was for our, for, the, for our generation. So the whole book of Enoch is accounts of interactions with the angels, with the watchers. It's his touring of the heavens, the stars, the universe, the earth, and all that makeup. So we're not going to go into all that because we're not trying to stick with the purpose now. <laughs> and that, but in Enoch 14, starting at verse 14, it says, And as I quaked and trembled, I fell upon my face, and I beheld a vision. And lo, there was a second house greater than the former, and the entire portal stood open before me, and it was built of flames of fire. And in every respect, it so excelled in splendor and magnificence and extent that I cannot describe to you its splendor and its extent. And its floors was a fire, and above it were lightnings and the path of the stars. And its ceiling also was flaming fire. And I looked and saw therein a lofty throne, its appearance was as crystal, and the wheels thereof as a, the shining sun. And there was a vision of cherubim, and from underneath the throne came streams of flaming fire, so that I could not look thereon. And the great glory set thereon, and his raiment shone more brightly than the sun, and was whiter than any snow. Now you're going to see when we go through a lot of these scriptures, and a lot of these things, that we'll see a lot of the same descriptions. And, and, and account after account. And that's because out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So we can't take the book of Enoch as, as a canonized scripture, as scripture, but because what he said in Enoch is also in Ezekiel, is also in Revelation, then it's a mouth of two or three witnesses. Does that make sense? When I first started going into the heavens, and and I and and you got to understand, I was not in a church that believed that. And Steve was always encouraging me. He's just he said, "Just let Holy Spirit take you where you're going to go." And he was always encouraging me. And I was always being told, growing up, it's my imagination, so it's just all my imagination. But when we went to a prophetic conference here in the city, and Jeff Jansen was there. And Jeff started describing a massive door. And he started describing it in detail. And that same door that he was describing, I had already seen in, in heaven, in my visions. And I, would, I hit Steve probably pretty hard. And I said, if this is my imagination, why is he seeing it? And that's happened over and over with confirmations. And you can pay attention because the Lord will give you confirmations when you need it. And it's because... It's, it can't be your imagination if other people are seeing it. And heaven is actually a real place. It can be mapped out. Okay, it's a real, real it's, it doesn't change. I mean, it's a huge place. There's a lot of different places in it. It's a lot of different facets in it. But if you're going to the throne room, you know you're in the throne room, and it looks like the throne room. And I, I remember one time I was in a meeting with... Um, That Sarger, I think. I might be wrong, but I think it was him. 
And he was saying, well, you know, when you go around to the courts, you're standing in the, in the throne room and you're going around to the court room around the corner. And I'm thinking, I know where he's going because heaven's real and you can map it out. And everybody, when you're going to the throne room, you're going, I mean, going from the throne room to the courtroom, you're going the same way. Does that make sense? So, so when you see that, you're going to see out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, you know that what you're seeing, you know that what you're hearing is truth. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, Enoch, I just want to, we'll just keep going because um, I want to cover this scripture. Okay, Enoch chapter 60 and verse 2. It says, in the visions I saw how a mighty quaking made the heavens of heavens to quake. And all the hosts of the Most High and the angels, a thousand thousands and ten thousands times ten thousands, were disquieted with a great disquiet. And the head of days sat on the throne of his glory, and the angels and the righteous stood around him. And Michael said to me, why art thou disquieted with such a vision? Until this day lasted the day of his mercy, and he has been merciful and long-suffering toward those who dwell on the earth. And the day and the power and the punishment and the judgment has come, for which the Lord of Spirits has prepared for those who worship not the righteous law. For those who deny the righteous judgment, and for those who take his name in vain, that day is prepared. For the elect, a covenant, but for the sinners, an inquisition. So Enoch was recording the day of judgment. And he explained a much in his book. And he showed us things to come. He even showed a detailed parable of Moses leading the Israelites out of Egypt. Even to the point of them crossing the Red Sea. So when Moses was at the Red Sea, and the Lord said, why don't you stand here talking to me? It's because he had already had a parable from the book of Enoch. They told him what he was supposed to do. Because Enoch had written all this down. So there's always a purpose for a person going into the heavens by the Holy Spirit. There's always a purpose. It's to learn something. It's to gain revelation. To gain understanding. It's to see into a future event. The fruit is always good if Holy Spirit is the guide. Okay? And you'll hear me say that over and over. Holy Spirit has to be the guide. If not, then it's easy to get into error. So you're going to see me say that. Or you're going to hear me say that over and over. So if we go on through the scriptures, Jacob saw into heaven as the Lord was making covenant with him. It says in Genesis 28, a ladder was set up on earth and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it. So even when Jacob was getting the covenant from God and, and cutting covenant, he saw into the heavens and saw the Lord standing there. Moses was taken into heaven and showed the tabernacle. Okay, we know these scriptures. In Exodus 26, it says, And you shall raise up the tabernacle according to its pattern, which you were shown on the mountain. And in Hebrews, um, a lot of times it's talking about the, cop the copy and shadow of heavenly things. It was in Hebrews 8. As Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. So Moses was making a copy of what he had seen in heaven. Okay, does that make sense? So in Hebrews 9, verse 23, it says, um, It was necessary that the copies of the things in heaven would be purified with these, talking about the blood of sheep and goats, okay? But the heavenly things themselves would better sacrifice than these. The heavenly things require the blood of Jesus Christ himself. And so he's talking about the copies of things in heaven were put in the tabernacle. How did you get copies? By being shown. You know, you can, if you read in Exodus, you can, you can see the description. But if you take that description, people can interpret that in different ways. Okay. If you look at the menorah and it says you're going to have the apple, the almond blossoms along with the flowers, along with their uh, bulbs. Where do you know to where, to, where to put the blossom and where to put the nut and where to put, unless you, how can you make it exactly the way it is in heaven unless you're shown? Because even by description, an artist will take that and go artistic license. Anyway, I'm married to an artist, so. But, <laughs> but the thing is, Moses was taken and shown these patterns so he could say, see it exactly. And that's why when we study the tabernacle and the temple, 
we can get greater understanding of the throne room of the things in the heavens and, and how the heaven works. Because this was a pattern, what we have in the tabernacle and the temple was a pattern of exactly what's in heaven. So, and that's a whole different story, but I mean a whole different teaching. But those are, those are why these things are important. It wasn't just that God sat down and said, Moses, write this out and this is what, I'm gonna, what you need to make. He showed Moses directly. Okay, it also talks about the elders of Israel, along with Moses and Aaron. They also saw him to heaven. In Exodus 24, verse 9, it says that Moses went up, also Aaron, Nabad, and Abihu, and 70, 70, 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, and it was like the very heavens in its clarity. But the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his, lay his hand. So they saw God, and they ate and drank. So the, so the elders, along with Moses and, and the priest, cut covenant with God himself by eating a fellowship meal in heaven. Okay, so, so they went to heaven. We don't think about that. We say, oh, no, they just went to the mountain. No, it, they saw God, and they ate and drank. And it was a miracle that God didn't lay his hand on them. So, so they made covenant in heaven. If you look at David in the Psalms, he wrote about the heavens and about God's throne, about, the, about all of this a lot in the Psalms, okay? Um, he even said, how you go there? Who may ascend? Psalms 24. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, right? Who has not lifted up his soul to an idol nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord. So David was one who went into the heavens and he said, this is how you go. This is how you ascend. He also received the plans and instructions for Solomon's temple. Just like Moses received the, the plans for the tabernacle, David received the plans for the temple. Now he couldn't build the temple because he had blood on his hands. But he had prepared, if you read in, in 1 Chronicles, he prepared everything for Solomon. And in 1 Chronicles 28, 19, he says, All this, said David, the Lord has made me understand in writing by his hand upon me all the works of these plans. So we see that again and again, God shows us plans. He shows us instruction in the heavenly places. Daniel was another one who wrote about the last days and the end of times a lot. Okay, Daniel 7, starting at verse 9, it says, And I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days were seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, his wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. Notice this is the same description of the throne that Enoch had. Okay? Then if you look at Daniel 10, verse 5, it says, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with gold of Uphaz. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire, his arms and feet like burnished bronze in color, and the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. I don't know about you, but if you look in Revelation, you see the same description that John wrote in Revelation 1, starting at verse 13. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a gold band. His head and hair was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. So you see here, just in, just in these three last passages that I wrote, you have Enoch describing the throne as a patriarch before, the co before a covenant. You see Daniel describing the same throne. You see Daniel describing the Son of Man. And he was an old, and remember Daniel was old covenant. And then you see John, new covenant, describing the same Son of Man. So, so heaven... God, you know, I think there's a scripture that says, you know, God never changes. 
Heaven never changes. It's the same. Old Testament, New Testament, old, you know, now, today, it's the same. We just have to start looking at this and paying attention to it and having faith in this. Okay. Isaiah was called and commissioned in his vision of heaven. We all know Isaiah 6, starting in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, right, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings, and with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. You know, and you can go ahead back and read the whole account of that. We read it. We were, I was a missionary kid. We read it every missionary service, you know, because it says, the Lord says, who am I? Send me. Steve, <laughs> Steve was the same way. Missionary kids, we know this. You know, the Lord said, who am I? Send me. And who will go for us? And, and Isaiah said, here I am. Send me. But he also said, oh, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. And it says the seraphim took a coal. Where? From the altar. And he put it on his lips. I don't know about you, but that would sizzle. So, but, but this was the commissioning and calling of Isaiah. He was in the temple and he had a vision of heaven. Ezekiel also was called and commissioned in the heavenlies. In Ezekiel 1, this is a long passage, but you know, it makes a point. Okay, Ezekiel 1, <laughs> starting at verse 4. Then I looked, and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north, a great cloud with raging fire engulfing itself, and the brightness was all around it, and radiating out of its mist like the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. Also from within it came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Each one had four faces, and each one had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the soles of calves' feet. They sparkled like the color of burnished bronze. So it goes on to explain, and it, and it talks about the cherubim and it, and, and, it, and it gives the likeness and, and it describes the living creatures and their appearance as burning coals of fire. And, and then it goes on and talks about, in verse 15, it talks about the wheel and the wheels within the wheels and the, and the eyes all around the wheels. And, and these were the living creatures and the spirit of the living creatures. And so Ezekiel goes into very strong detail into what these creatures, what these living creatures look like, what the seraphim look like, what the cherubim look like. And I think a lot of times there, this is in the scripture because when you start going into heavens and you start seeing all the, what we would consider weird things, you would think that's my imagination. But if you, if you look in the scriptures, they're described in the scriptures, you know, and, and things, the, the angels don't look like the little cherub that is always pictured with the chubby cheeks and you know, no, and and they're described in the in the scriptures as as warriors, and as creatures with calves' legs and wings all around and eyes all over and and four faces and all this. So you see all that, but then in verse twenty two. It says, the likeness of the firmament above the heads of the living creatures was the color of an awesome crystal, crystal stretched out over their heads. And so you see again the crystal and you see the firmament and you see in, um, on verse 26 that above the, above the firmament was the likeness of a throne in appearance like a sapphire stone. What did the elders see? They say that they saw the sapphire stone. Why? Because they were from the, they were looking up from the bottom. Ezekiel was looking from the top of the floor. And so he said, and on the likeness of the throne was the likeness of the appearance of a man high above it. Also from the appearance of his waist and up, I saw, as it were, the color of amber with the appearance of fire all around within it. And from the appearance of his waist and downward, I saw, as it was, the appearance of fire with brightness all around it. Like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And Ezekiel said, so when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard a voice of one speaking. If you go on and read in that passage, it, it, it's the commissioning. Um, the Lord tells Ezekiel who he was going to be prophesying to, what he was going to be prophesying to. And he said, don't even pay attention 
to their their looks. Don't pay attention to what they're looking like. Don't be don't even worry about it if you're sitting among thorns and briars. And he said, you know, if you tell a righteous man uh, what his sin is and the righteous man turns, then he's no longer sinning. But if he doesn't, the, the blood's on his hands. But if you don't tell him, the blood's on your hands. I mean, it goes through all that. That was the commissioning of Ezekiel that the Lord told him when Ezekiel had a vision of heaven. <clears throat> so, so it's very... So if you see both of those, Ezekiel and Isaiah, had very strong callings. But if you think about it, they had very strong prophecies that they had to prophesy too. Okay? So, so those kind of experiences are so ingrained in you that even through the hardest times, you don't, you don't move from them. Because it's like, it's like when you have an experience like that in the heavenlies, it becomes part of your DNA. And nobody can argue with experience. So, and there's always a purpose, again, there's always a purpose. So, these, so far we've been in the Old Testament, now we find records in the New Testament. You know, Stephen, in Acts 7, when he was being martyred, it said, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Now, think about, it. can you imagine how this strengthened the believers. Here was Stephen, the first one among them to be martyred. And he was dying a pretty horrific death, being stoned. But what happened? He saw into heaven and he saw the Son of Man. He saw Jesus himself standing by the throne of God. And just by him saying that, he's like, what we're doing here is not in vain. Jesus is true. He was here. He is our Messiah. He is now standing at the right hand of God. He is always there for us. And that's who I'm seeing while I'm dying. I'm going to be there and I'll be there with him. That was the message that Stephen gave the believers. So there's always a purpose. I mean, what happened when he said that is the Jews got even better. And even Paul was there and you know, they really stoned him then. But, but to the believers, it was a good, the fruit was good. It was a strong testimony. So heaven is not just, going to heaven is not just for goosebumps and chills. It's for a purpose. Okay, everybody good so far? So far, so good. Okay. So Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know and whether out of the body I do not know. God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. So Paul was saying, you know, of course, we all know this is, this is Paul, but he was, he was shown revelations. He was shown things that some things he wasn't allowed to utter. Some things you're not supposed to say once you, and you'll be told you don't say that. But he also received the understanding of how the new covenant completes the old covenant. We have the Pauline epistles because of Paul's heavenly visitations. And because he, he said, you know, he said, I did not receive all this from, from a man. He said, I received these revelations from Jesus Christ himself. He, he called himself an apostle born out of time. Because he wasn't, he wasn't called by Jesus when Jesus was on the earth. Jesus came and called him on the road to Damascus. And in 2 Corinthians, if we go on down to verse 7, Paul said, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations. Where did he get this abundance of revelations? From his heavenly visitations. It says, A thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Paul was given the grace to stay humble because of the great revelations he received. And... So that was the revelations he received in the heavenlies. Now, I'm not going to go into the thorn in the flesh thing, but Paul was given great revelation, okay? And he was given a messenger of Satan as a thorn in the flesh. So some of these people who say, oh yeah, I've been given a thorn in the flesh, they just realize you have to have pretty great revelation, <laughs> And, he, and then God, Paul was also given the grace because of those revelations, okay? And it's a purpose for him to, to, so that he doesn't get into pride, okay? So there's always a purpose. God doesn't do anything arbitrarily. It's with a purpose, okay? 
So this other, I want to go into another, excuse me, this other extra biblical book. And, and there's a lot of these apocryphal books. And I will, you know, I'm not one to say go read them all unless the Lord directs you because a lot of them are not true. Okay, sometimes you can read two words and say, ah, this is not of God. If it goes against the scripture, it is not of God. But a lot of these bring you extra understanding and they do not go against the word of God. And this is one, and it's the Apocalypse of Paul. Apocalypse, I said that right. Apocalypse of Paul. And, I mean, no, no. Apocalypse of Peter. Sorry. This is Apocalypse of Peter. So Peter gives this account. And he said, As we prayed, suddenly there appeared two men standing before the Lord toward the east, on whom we were not able to look. For there came forth from their countenance a ray as of the sun, and their raiment was shining, such as eye of man never saw. For no mouth is able to express or heart to conceive the glory with which they were endued, and the beauty of their appearance. And as we looked upon them, we were astounded. For their bodies were whiter than any snow, and reddier than any rose. And the red thereof was mingled with the white, and I am utterly unable to express their beauty. For their hair was curly and bright and seemly, both on their face and shoulders, as it were a wreath of, ro of woven of spikenard and divers colored flowers, or like a rainbow in the sky, such was their seemliness. Seeing therefore their beauty, we became astounded at them, and since they appeared suddenly, and I approached the Lord and said, Who are these? And he said to me, These are your brethren, the righteous, whose forms you desire to see. And I said to him, And where are all the righteous ones? And what is the eon in which they, which they are and have this glory? And the Lord showed me a very great country outside of this world, exceeding bright with light, and the air there lighted with the rays of the sun, and the earth itself blooming with unfading flowers, and all and full of spices and plants, fair, flowering, and incorruptible, and bearing blessed fruit. And so great was the perfume that it was borne thus even unto us. And the dwellers in that place were clad in the raiment of shining angels, and the raiment was like unto their country, and angels hovered about them there. And the glory of the dwellers there were, was equal, and with one voice they sang praises alternately to the Lord God, rejoicing in that place. The Lord said to us, This is the place of your high priest, the righteous men. And over against that place I saw another squalid, and it was a place of punishment. And those who were punished there and the punishing angels had their raiment dark like the air of that place. And he goes on from there and he describes the levels and the horrors of hell in detail. If you want to read it, feel free, but it's pretty gross. Okay, but there is a heaven and there is a hell. And so, and then, so just like Paul went to, no, Peter Peter went to hell and was describing hell. So then John, he went, John the Beloved, he went to heaven. And he wrote the whole book of Revelation based on his visitations to heaven. All right. So he said, of course, we know this in, in Revelation 1. It says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And, and what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to, Th to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And then it goes on to what we just read before about the Son of Man. And then it goes on to Revelation 4. Again, we've heard this all the time. And if you listen to Steve Swanson and Steve Mitchell, you hear this all the time. And after these things, I looked. And behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one set on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and sardius stone in appearance, in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. 
Before their throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had the face of a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. eagle. And the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. So John gives very detailed accounts. And he gives prophetic parables all the way through the book of Revelation about the last days. And he gives details about heaven and the new heaven and the new earth that's, that's to come. This is the book of Revelation. It's his visitations. So as we can see through these scriptures, we were always meant to go into the heavenlies. But now we have even greater access. Hebrews 10 Verse 19 says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated through us through the veil that is his flesh. Through Jesus' flesh being ripped open, we have that excess, that portal to go into the heavens with boldness. Okay? It's by Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2 Starting at verse 4, it says, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So in the Spirit, we are always seated with Christ in heaven. Okay? We just need to learn to access this realm through Holy Spirit. You know, we're, we're much more effective when we are ruling from the heavenly seats versus when we're looking up from an earthly position. So there's reasons to go into the heavenlies. There's reasons to, to go set with Christ in our position. Now, I'm a very firm believer, again, that you only go by Holy Spirit being the instigator and the guide. Okay, instigator. He's the one that starts it. He's the one that, that's, that tells you where you're going to go how you're going to go, when you're going to go. Okay, if you allow him to direct you and submit to him, you're not getting to error. Okay, well, the error comes when you start trying it. You know that you have that right, so let's do it. That gets into a little bit of trouble. So, but if, you're, if we're just looking at the biblical records and not even taking into account all the vast accounts of, of the early saints and even the stories of today, you hear all the time about people going to heaven today. Um, we see that visitations of heaven, they do and they, they can and they do happen now. Okay? Either in visions, dreams, trances, or physically. Okay? So it can happen in any way that the Lord says it can, that he wants it to happen. So you can, I mean, Paul said, I don't know if I'm in the body or not. You know? You hear Jesse DePlantis, he didn't know if he was in the body or not. So, so there, you can go physically, or you can go with visions and trances, or in dreams, okay? But there's always a purpose. There's always fruit. Anything the Holy Spirit does, there's going to be good fruit. And you, and you judge it by its fruit. Jesus is very clear. So there's callings, commissionings, instructions that are given in the heavenly realm. You know, I didn't have a mentor on earth. Again, the church that I went to, they, they had pretty much thrown the baby out with the bathwater when it came to prophetic, you know. And so I was given mentors in heaven, both angelic and some of the cloud of witnesses that were my mentors and still are my mentors and taught most of everything that I know. Because at that point, I had put everything that I'd been taught on the shelf. And I had said, Lord, I'm done playing church. And I literally threw my Bible in the corner and said, if it's you, I want to know it. If it's not, I'm done. And the Holy Spirit walked me through that and showed me the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. And then, give, and then these mentors taught me the things that I know, both from the, from the heavenly realms and the, and the spiritual laws. Again, always based on the Bible. Okay, They never go against scripture. Holy Spirit will never go against scripture. And those who are the righteous ones and the angels, the true angels, will never go against scriptures. 
So you can always, um, you always, always, always have the scriptures as your foundation. And that was when a lot of times when I would have experiences and I would pretty much go ballistic. And Steve would talk me down and say, well, here's the scriptures. And it was always back to, here's the scriptures. Steve has a, has a great um, gifting of remembering the scriptures and being able to quote them. And to me, that was a gift that I needed because not only he encouraged me, but he was my, he was the one that I bounced things off of. So, and he, it was really good. And so if you don't have that, you still have the Bible. You still have the scriptures. Holy Spirit will never go against that. Okay, also, when you're going into the heavens again, you have revelations, get new understandings. You look into the future. You know, time doesn't exist in eternity. Heavens and eternity, time doesn't exist there. So when you go there, you can see the past, present, and future. And you, have, and, and they can get, you can get some understandings in that. So visitations can and will bring healing. Emotional, spiritual, and physical. There's good fruit in visitations. God doesn't do things arbitrarily. Every good gift comes from the Father of lights. Right? Okay, but he always has a plan and a purpose. Error st happens when we step out of his plan. Okay, so there's, a, there's teachings, I think we've all heard them. There's teachings and practices now about how to go into the heavenlies, how to go to the stars, how to go to the throne room, you know, go float in space for a while. It's possible. You're created to do that. Okay, it's exciting. It's great. Again, follow the Holy Spirit. Okay, you always allow Holy Spirit to be the instigator. Okay, Jesus said, I don't do anything except what I hear my father say or what I see my father do. It goes for us too. And it especially goes when you're going into the spirit realm. Okay, let that Holy Spirit be your guide. Let him take you where you need to go. If you try and force things, it really does become your imagination. And your soulish thoughts can and will bring in error. Okay? It also opens the doors. And outside influences will influence you in what you're seeing and you're hearing. So if you will follow Holy Spirit, and if you allow Holy Spirit to be your guide, into the, and you can't enter into the heavenlies to experience the greater heights and the deeper depths. Okay? And we need the more. We need the understandings. We need the revelations, especially concerning the kingdom. 